are you, by the way? I'm in New Orleans. Oh, awesome. How's the food down there? Great, but it's like food galore. Yeah. Let's have another hurricane. And, you know, <laughs> Hey everyone, thank you always for coming to hang out with me. I'm Evelyn and this is Repin. This podcast has allowed me to have authentic, personal, and insightful conversations with amazing people. These are conversations that have given me things to think about. Whether or not you agree with my guests, ask yourself one question. Would you be willing to do what they're doing? To speak so honestly and so publicly? If not, just recognize how much it takes and check out what they have to say. Now, throughout my career, I've had the great pleasure to have worked with some fantastic people, like my next guest. I know him to be someone whose words have weight. He's a passionate man and a talented actor. You've seen him as Detective Hank Griffin on NBC's Grimm, Carl Gatewood in The Affair, Lost in Space as Grant Kelly, and he gave a pitch-perfect performance in the film The Hate You Give, There, he starred as Maverick Carter, the reformed gang member and father struggling to guide and protect his family through the cycle of violence and racism. He and I have had some great conversations, so I was thrilled that he said yes to coming on this show. I suspect this episode is one you're gonna come back to time and again, because it's fully loaded with powerful insight. So sit back and buckle up, because we've got the incredible Russell Hornsby. Russell, first and foremost, thank you so much for coming on the show. You know I love working with you, and you know I've enjoyed all of our conversations on and off camera. So thank you so much for for coming on. How are you? I mean, because you look amazing. Thank you. I'm doing great. I'm surviving. I'm down here right now in New Orleans shooting this show for Hulu called Iron Mike. And I'm playing Don King. <laughs> oh. Oh. Of all characters. I mean, it's funny what happens in like the transformation period. And I think people kind of like, I'm playing him at his age, but I'm, they're calling me the young Don King. <laughs> nice. Like when people were introduced to him, I don't think people ever thought of him as young at any point. You know what I mean? Yeah, he was just sort of trapped in this one yeah. sort of time frame. When he had that like sort of crazy gnome hair. Right. Or the hair from like those troll dolls. They said, Every strand is a, is a citadel. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I know you're really busy, and I really want you to know how much I appreciate your time in coming here. Now, you also just finished uh, BMF. Yeah, Black Mafia Family. Yeah. Tell me about that. That finished uh, airing like about a week or two ago. We finished shooting it back in May. We're going to go for season two, I think, in February. Awesome. You know, I was on there playing yet another dad. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I'm like father of the century now. So yeah, but it's it, you know, it's good. You know what I mean? What do they say? Uh, you want to hear an actor complain, give him a job. <laughs> Seeing you on set, I know you're always ready to go. And you've always had your feet, you know, firmly on the ground. And I'll tell you this, all the different times that we've worked together, you have said multiple things where I'm like, ooh, I got to write that down for like a life lesson. Yeah. But I'm always in the middle of producing. So it's like 20 things are happening at the same time. I'm like, shit, what did you say? I got to write that down again. When I decided to do this podcast, I was like, oh, my God, I have to call Russell to see if he can come on the show. So I'm thrilled that you're here and we can hang out again. Yes. So I know you grew up in San Francisco and then you also moved to New York. Tell me a little bit about some of the early experiences that you had that became the fundamentals of the person that you are today. Yeah, well, I was born in San Francisco, but raised in Oakland. And so Oakland at the time was a very interesting place. It was very progressive city, you know, Oakland and Berkeley. And because of the political upheaval that happened and a lot of the um, protests and, and, and riots and Black Panthers and stuff like that, I was sort of raised in that spirit. You know, Oakland is a very socially conscious city that's mm. very aware at the time was very it was a race city, you know what I mean? And blacks were getting their asses kicked by the cops. And But we were always sort of ready to to fight right. and stand up for ourselves. So I was raised with that ethic of knowing who you are, knowing where you come from, you know, appreciating who I am as a young black man. But I was raised in a single parent household. 
my mother just always was saying, like, you got to remember you're a, you're a black, you're a black boy. And you have to watch sort of how you move in the city. Mm. And you have a target on your back. And my mother's saying this to me and my brother at like 10 years old, you know. Did you even know what she was talking about at the time? You no, know, no, not really, you know. And, right. And you're, you're just young. too young. But like, I, I understood the dynamics because we were raised in a, in a predominantly white neighborhood you know, ironically enough, right? And so, which one would call like a middle to upper middle class area of Oakland. And so I wasn't the ghetto kid. I was just the black kid. So I was, you know, coming up through like elementary school, I was, you know, playing soccer, you know what I mean? And right. primarily with white kids. Once I went to junior high school, I had to go to the schools on the other side of the tracks, so to speak. Hmm. <laughs> and I was around more black kids and more black kids from... I guess, very socioeconomic levels, you know what I mean? I like immediately got to see the difference in like how they were raised versus how I was raised or their lack of parental influence versus my mother. So that was like a two year period. Then I go to high school at an all boys Catholic high school named St. Mary's College High School in Berkeley. Then I, it's, a, it's, it's like a total 180. I'm with predominantly black kids, but they, most of them were sort of raised like me where, you know, some had single parents, some had one, uh, two parents, but we used to call ourselves uh, intelligent hoodlums. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And we all had a little mischief under our belt, you know what I mean? But right. we were smart and we had been exposed and we're getting even more exposure in this all boys Catholic high school, which for the longest time was predominantly white, but there's, there's coming this influx of African-American boys coming in. And I had probably, I like to think, like one of the best childhoods one could ever have. That's awesome. It's that kind of thing where you were given sort of a freedom to roam, but you knew you were young, you knew you were a student, you knew you were a kid, but you were given a lot of responsibility. You know, it was that nice time in life where, like, it was parents were telling you, like, go out and just do it. Just go. Like, get out of the house in the morning, go play with your friends. Make sure you're home when the street lights come on. You know, that kind of thing. You learn about the city. Like, you learn about the city. You learn about the neighborhood. You knew where not to go. You're getting in trouble running from dogs. You're, you know. You became streetwise. Yeah. Yeah. And also, we were raised by, you, you know, that old school saying that you were raised by the neighborhood. You were raised yeah. by the people in your neighborhood. Parents knew other people's parents. You know, it was that old school, you know, you'd sleep over your friends' houses, stuff like that. Or you would, like... Tell your mom, hey, mom, I'm sleeping over Eric Thompson's house tonight. Yeah. And then, you know, you're going somewhere else. Um, and you're some girl. You know what I mean? It was all that kind of stuff. Right. And it was innocent. It was fun. Uh, but it was just mischievous. It wasn't, like, dangerous. We were just mischievous kids. You know what I mean? Yeah. That period between you going to a, being a Black kid in a white, more white-dominated school, then going to a school that had different socially economic groups. Yeah. so to speak, and then going back into a school with uh, more people that were black, but also had more opportunity. Did that give you sort of like whiplash? I really got a, a sense, a great sense of a freedom of blackness, a freedom of culture mm. that I didn't understand at the time. You know what I mean? In retrospect, that's what it was. Right. Because again, we're growing up, we're listening to hip hop, which has influenced us. It's Music, rap music and hip-hop is coming of age. Yeah, that was the golden era. Yeah, we're being influenced by the consciousness of the music, right? And so the music is, is educating us. The music is inspiring us. And at the same time, you're around like-minded brothers who are hearing the same music and getting the same inspiration and getting the same influence. So you have a greater sense of self and purpose at that time that I feel maybe a lot of young black boys didn't get because we're all in this collective that yeah. we're, we're enriching each other. We're, in, we're inspiring each other. We're saying, hey, man, you can do that, along with the school that's saying, we expect you to be men. We expect you to be young men. We have a high expectation of what a St. Mary's man is. And we took that on. We put that coat on and wore it. So to be in a class with predominantly other brothers like you, mm -hmm. it, it made you a sense of pride. I was able to stand tall. 
So you do four years of that. And these are guys that I'm still friends with to this day. That's awesome. From 30 years later. Do you know what I mean? And so I'm saying to myself, I'm empowered now. I'm empowered with a sense of knowledge and of wisdom. And they say of understanding. I have the knowledge of where I come from, who I am as a black man. And then I have the wisdom of, of my elders hmm. about how to look at the world or how to see people, how to engage with people. And I have an understanding of the culture and society that's surrounding me. Right. And so you just put all those things together. I had a, a religion teacher named Mr. Harper, a black man. And we used to walk around, they used to walk around those t-shirts that say it's a black thing you wouldn't understand, right? Uh-huh. And he had this raspy voice, almost like a Danny Glover. And he would say, uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, it's not it's a black thing you wouldn't understand. It's supposed to be it's a black thing. Let me help you understand. That's awesome. And this is like 16, 17 years old. Right. Hearing somebody say, you, no, 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 don't try to push people away from who you are. Try to bring them into your world. Try to help them understand who you are. And how you do that is by your demeanor. How you do that is by how you show up every day for where you yes. work, where you learn, all that kind of stuff like that. So it is about your disposition. Yes. In light of that, how you welcome people in or how people see you is how you see yourself. And I'm learning all these things at 16, 17 years old. So then you take that, that understanding and that, uh, that wisdom and that outlook. Right. And I take that from St. Mary's in Berkeley to Boston University. Yeah. To now even, I think. Yeah. I know that people are going to look at me and prejudge. But I also know that I have, you know, just a way to sort of, in a, in a way, try to bypass that that negative energy that you want to have and ingratiate myself. I will confirm that. I will (laughs) confirm that. Because here's the thing about you. You are very self-assured, but you're very grounded. Sometimes when people say you have a great sense of self or you're self-assured, you know, that can imply cocky, but you're not that. You have a very quiet, but very like, pronounced presence about you, you walk onto a place and I just know you're there. I mean, besides the fact that you're like 6'2 and I could literally stand (laughs) behind you and disappear, which we've done before. (laughs) But you have a very good sense of self. You're always professional. You're always kind. As a producer, and I think we could both say this from both ends of our uh, jobs, it's not always the case when you're working with people. Um, (laughs) I feel like you have really brought those values now still. Do you think that's where some of your confidence or sense of self was established at this time period, like when you were 16, 17? Yes. And and the thing is, I had a, a blissful ignorance, which helped a great deal. Tell me more. Meaning I was aware of negative aspects of society and everything like that, but it wasn't thrust upon me. Okay. So like... I didn't grow up, you know, with roof leaking and roaches, you know, going around. But I knew that that existed. Mm -hmm. I grew up with a single mother, but my mother didn't walk around with a negative energy about being a single mother. Do you know what I mean? She accentuated the positive, as they say. Right. Right. And again, like I said, I was able to play soccer and learn all these other sports. And the house was festive and we had friends and all those kind of things like that. So there was a blissful ignorance Mm -hmm. that allowed me to continue to walk on sunshine. Okay. Hey, like life is good and I can go do the school play and I can go back and wow, the car starts, you know what I mean? Like, oh my gosh. And so you take that energy when everybody around you is still positive, even though yes, negative things happen, but everything around you is for the most part, it's positive. Right. And so I'm just a happy-go-lucky kind of person in general And so the longer you can go through life accentuating the positive before a real negative thing starts to hit you, which can really suppress your energy and your growth, the easier it will be to overcome when those things happen. And I think that's what I think really helped me. It was like, 
I didn't start getting my ass kicked until I got to New York after I graduated college. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. No, I hear you. But let me just challenge you this. I agree with what you're saying. But the flip side of that could have been that when you have a positive run, mm -hmm. let's say, right, for most of your life, which is great and you're incredibly blessed and lucky. Right. Sometimes when that first negative thing hits you, it could sweep the legs out from underneath you because you don't know how to deal with it. So when was that first time that attitude was challenged and what happened and how did you navigate and what did you learn? Okay. So interesting. I got to New York and when I graduated from Boston University, I got a $15,000 career entry scholarship, which was called the Conroe. Oh, awesome. And, and so you had to like go through this, this whole thing we had to do, write an essay about why you should win the award. And then you had to go for an interview and right. then you had to like do a presentation. And I still remember my opening style. I get to $15,000 and I go to New York, I get agent, get manager. And I was basically lazy, like in a sense of like, I didn't want to work. Like I didn't want to like go get a job. You know what okay. I mean? So I'm like living yeah, off yeah. this $15,000 and, I got a nice apartment up, you know, upper on 110th between Columbus and Manhattan. And yeah. I'm spending money, going out with guys, drinking beer, you know, that kind of shit. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'll never forget this. I was doing a small play in like, you know, downtown and in like Soho or something like that. And like a, you know, little storefront with one light. And I was broke by this point. Okay. I was broke. And I stole... $40 from the writer and the director of the show, a woman named Dominique, very lovely woman. The next day, she says to the cast, hey, you know, you know, somebody stole money out of my purse. It doesn't matter. I don't even know who it is, but if you could return it, that would be great. Mm. And so I was like, wow. So I go up to her and I said, um, hey, Dominique, I said, I'm so sorry. I stole the money. And I stole the money. I said, I don't I didn't have any money. Boom, boom. And she said, oh, I, I knew you stole it. I said, wow. I said, well, how'd you know? She says, because I can see the desperation on you. Oh, wow. At that point, I said, I didn't want to be that guy. Mm. I don't want to be that guy that people talk about, that they whisper about. My father wasn't always in my life, but he wasn't always the best person. You know what I mean? He wasn't Understood, most yeah. trustworthy. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you hear stories about your father and things happen to you. And you say, you realize, I don't want to be him. And I saw at that moment, that could be me. And then you're the guy that people don't want to see around. And from that moment, I said, I have to be on the up and up with everything that I do in my life. because. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the liar, the cheat that people often talk about. Right. And so I sort of slowly just sort of got better with myself. I ended up <laughs> getting evicted because I was broke from my apartment. I graduated in 92. This is like April of 93. Okay. And I called my mom and I said, mom, I said, I'm broke. I don't have any money. So mom's on the phone. She said she was, it was silent for about like five or 10 seconds of silence. Mm -hmm. and she said, huh? Took you longer than I thought and hung up. And I realized right there, like motherfucker, you on your own, Jack. You on your own. And so I got, got out of the apartment, got kicked out, stayed on friends' couches for a little bit. And then I got a call from one of my former professors at BU. And he said, hey, I'm doing six degrees of separation mm. and the importance of being earnest in rep up at this uh, Pet Dragon Theater. And they pay $150 a week. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> They'll give you housing. That was really big for that time yeah. and also big for your situation. Yeah. So I'm like, bet, I gotta, I'll have a place to stay for the summer. And I was able like, to get a little small job being a janitor, basically. Uh -huh. I was like literally saving $100 a week. And I was like eating, the, you know, top ramen and, you know, canned string beans. And, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my mother comes to visit and she comes to see my show. She stays for like a week and, you know, take her around. She takes me out to eat this and that. So I'm thinking, mom's here. 
You know. Uh-huh. And then it was time for her to leave, and she was like, Hey, I had a great time. It was a great scene. I'm proud of you. You're doing well. And you, you, hey, you can act. God damn, okay, you know what the fuck you're doing. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Didn't leave me. me. Yeah. <laughs> and and I was like, yeah. Oh, I'm getting the hang of this. You're on your own. All you have now is your word as your bond. Yes. You have to get right. You have to stay right. You have to be impeccable with your word. You just sort of build yourself up from there. And then when I got back to New York, I started just working on it. Right. I had to get a job. You know I mean? Right. <laughs> to do things, you know, that kind of stuff. And because you're young, you knew you can still reinvent yourself. Yes. You come back and everything was, oh, nobody knew. No social media. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm cool, you know. People know about what happened. And also the, in- the integrity and the dignity of the woman, Dominique, not to spread that. Absolutely. And I think she did that because I was honest with her about what I had done. And so she said, you know what? I'm going to keep that with myself. I'm not going to tell that. I'm not going to ruin his reputation over that. Right. And so that was the beginning. As you were telling the story, I could see how emotional you were getting and how powerful and how difficult that moment was for you. But I feel like you definitely still embody and not only embody those values of your word means something, your actions mean something, you live it. Now, I, there's something that I wanted to kind of get back to. The interesting thing is with Dominique, with your mother, mm-hmm. with school, mm-hmm. the school teacher, even though maybe in some ways they sort of guided or mentored you. Not necessarily overtly, like they might not have sat you down and said, hey, you know, this is what you need to do. Your mom just sort of mentored you and just made you do it. Baptism by fire. Whereas your teacher actually informed you a little bit, but still mentored you. Can you talk a little bit about what you think their mentorship did for you and how you're taking those sort of examples and applying them in your life today and the world we're living in. Again, I come from a time when they talk about young people being seen and not heard. Right. Now, I think it's invaluable. I think it was positive. I think it was necessary. And then you were always encouraged, like, don't speak unless you have something of value to say. Yes. Ask questions, you know what I mean? And sometimes just don't even ask questions. I don't even, you know what I mean? Just shut the hell up and listen. (laughs) Yeah. Your your question ain't even valuable. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) If you listen long enough, it'll be answered. Right. That kind of thing. We weren't encouraged at that time to like, just speak out. Just, hey, this is me. I feel, you know, you were just sort of said like, hey, just your your turn will come. Be quiet and listen. I just took that to heart. And so I just became a constant repository of information, of examples, of uh, guidance, Mm -hmm. and just listened. And that was, I think, my genius. That has been my genius um, throughout my life and my career. And so I was always absorbing things. And then the lesson would come up later, like, oh, my gosh, so-and-so brought, said that. that I'm in this situation. I know how to handle myself. I know how to deal with it, you know? You know, listen to grown folks talk about their issues. Listen Mm. to grown folks talk about their spouses and jobs and everything like that. And, you know, I had to go in there and tell that motherfucker that, you know, da, 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 and I told him, and, you know, and then I ended up getting fired. That's why right. I got me. <laughs> and then someone's so saying like, why did you do that? Why did you, you know, and you just listen, what happened was I have a mentor in Los Angeles. His name is Ren Troy Brown, one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. And he befriended me when I got to Los Angeles in 2000. Mm-hmm. And this man was is just a wealth of knowledge and wisdom and just information. It's just ridiculous, right? So he was just sharing aspects of the world, of the arts, mm. of Hollywood, of theater. He's 10 years my senior. He was like a fourth generation Angelino. His family had grown up in the business. And so he was like just taking me under his wing and taking me places and saying, This is where this started, and that's who did that and originated these roles. And this is what happened, you know, when Ron O'Neill was young, and this is what I was 
trajectory came to be Superfly, things like that. So I sat, basically sat at his knee and listened for 10 years. Metaphorically sat at his knee for 10 years and just listened. And he would tell me how to conduct myself when you go to set. What happens when you go into an audition room? What happens when you do a producer meeting? Right. And I was just like absorbing and listening. As my time came, as I'm coming of age, so I'm, I meet him in my mid-20s, and you're looking at mid-30s to late-30s, and now you're, you're having to come of age, and now I'm transitioning from a boy into a man, and I'm seeing how they're treating me different now because I'm no longer a boy, I'm a man, and I'm a black man, and I'm a black man who's six feet and this, that, and a third. And so they would say, don't be afraid to put on your, uh, your Jackie Robinson jersey. Come with a Nat King Cole smile and get those Bojangles tap shoes because that's what you have to do in this game, in this business. Yeah. And see, the thing that was, it's knowing you have to do it, but how do you, how do you conduct yourself? Mm. People don't want to admit that we all got to shine. To survive in this world, regardless of what industry you're in, right. you have to shine and you have to play the game. That's it. And so he was informing me that there's certain ways that you can go about doing it. Right. And not feel like it's eating at your integrity. 100% agree. That's a big lesson. Huge. But you realize all that starts from knowing who you are, being happy and good with who you are. Right. This Having the inner strength comes from inside, from within first. So you learn, you got to deal with your bullshit. You got to deal with your past. You got to deal with your issues, your pain, all that stuff. So then you come out on the other side and go, I'm better now. And I'm ready to go tackle this world. But my thing was listening and realizing I, I didn't know shit. The humility to know. Yes, thank you. Thank you. The humility. I realized when I'm getting all this information, I'm feeding off of it. It's getting, I'm like, fuck, I'm deficient. Right. Oh, shit. I don't know shit. It caused me to just even talk less. Like, I remember I was in a room. Ren, he took me. We went to go here. Minister Louis Farrakhan performed mm. at the Cerrito Center for the Performing Arts in Los Angeles. I was there with a guest of his. So we see Farrakhan. After the show, we go to Tavis Smiley, his office, Michael Eric Dyson, Cornell West, and a few others. So it was probably like about 20 people. So I'm, I'm suited and booted. He takes me around, takes me to the thing. And I go. And these men, these luminaries are sitting at this table, like discussing issues of the day. Like real shit. I'm sitting there just like. Just absorbing, absorbing. and just taking it all in. That's a master class. Yes. And you realize there's not a question you could ask that's worth asking at that motherfucking moment. Russell. <laughs> Shut the hell up. Just yeah. sit there and listen. Yes. And the funny thing is, when it was over, as you know, my friend Randy, he's dropped, he's taking me back home. We're going it's late, probably it's like after midnight. I didn't even know how to absorb the moment. I didn't even know, I didn't even know what to ask after. Like Yeah, because it's so big. Yeah. It's constantly through my life, just having moments like those. I often try to tell young people. Once you stand on the battlefield, once you proclaim yourself an adult, you can't go back. So be a kid as long as you can. And so the reason why I say that, it's like that whole thing of like, you can't go home again. Once you leave your parents' house, whether it be for school, whether it be, it's never the same when you go back, right? No, you can't, no, you can't ever go back to where you were. Right. It, metaphorically and even literally. Yeah, Absolutely. So I'm telling young people, hey, 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 I hear you went to school. You read a bunch of books and shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's philosophy. You minored in philosophy and sociology while you mastered in theater, all that bullshit. You think you know shit. You don't know shit. <laughs> yeah. When you think you're an adult mm. and once you plant your flag in the ground and say, I'm an adult, metaphorically, I'm an adult now, people stop giving you information. They stop learning you. Because you know it. Think about it, what happens as, as we're older, right? Nobody tells you when that you, you know what I mean? When they see people watch what you're doing in your life, but nobody says to you, yeah, I'm right. that. they just let you do it. 
Now you might ask them a year or so later, man. Should I? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would. I didn't think it was a good idea if you. Did, did, did. Why? You, hey, man, you grow. You grow, right. and that's what happens. So if you leave the nest metaphorically too early, you lose all of that that knowledge, all that wisdom that you could have gotten from a mentor, from an adult, from somebody, from a teacher, because you said or you're saying I'm grown. You can't tell me shit. I love our conversations because it's it's always real. So yeah. here's my thing. I mean, there is so much division, be it mm -hmm. government, race. Mm -hmm. Certainly, we could go down the list there. Mm -hmm. It's a very deep rabbit hole of how much division there is in the world. I mean, it's in almost every yes. avenue of our lives. Do you feel like one part of that cause of that division is that everybody thinks they know their shit mm -hmm. and there is no listening and there is no interest in learning or being a student. Mm -hmm. And there is nobody that is willing to mentor or maybe there's too many people wanting to mentor. Like, what are you seeing, Russell, in terms of what some of the problems are that's causing the multitude of issues and division that we're experiencing today? I, I think it's uh, it's a host of things, but I think that at its core, I feel I believe we've empowered young people to speak their mind mm -hmm. because of where technology is and where society is, and like all the information highway. You know, these kids know a lot more than I we did when we were kids, and we've coddled them. I think a lot of young people have been coddled coming up. We hovered and we helicoptered and we said, oh, you, you're so important and that you're the best and that you can do whatever you want, whatever you want to do in life, it's a, you can do it, right? Right. But we're never honest and really saying to most people, now poor folks know this shit. You you broke, you know what I'm saying? I don't know what you want is. You know that you know you can't have everything. You can't always get what you want. You have to bust your ass, right? right? Yes. Poor folks notwithstanding. <laughs> <laughs> and immigrants. And immigrants. And immigrants. Right, who usually come in poor. You know what I'm saying? Yes. By and large. So you say you can do it, be whatever you want. You can you can have it. You can do it. And then when life hits you in the fucking face, you start, this ain't fair. And they're not prepared. You're not prepared or willing to listen because you were basically told and encouraged that you had all the answers. You know what I mean? That's a really good point. Nobody yeah. can tell you anything. Like, yeah, what are you talking about? My mama told me I can, I can do what I want, be what I want. Okay, that's cool. It's like that joke that Chris Rock told in his tambourine. He was like, we're teaching kids not to be bullies. We're teaching kids not to fight. And so no bullying policy. And his point was, yeah, but there are bullies out there. When a yeah. bully shows up, you don't know how to fuck to deal with it. <laughs> and in life, you can't run to the fucking teacher. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or the cops ain't got nothing for you. You know what I mean? The cops ain't trying to help you. Or government saying, kiss my ass. And so you don't know how to handle yourself. I feel like when you're looking at mentorship and you look at learning, I'm finding by and large that a lot of kids don't want to sit for the lesson. The saying is, a minute is a measure of time, but a moment is a measure of meaning. So they don't want to live for these moments that happen. And the moments happen sitting for the lesson. It's like, just give me the cliff notes. Yeah. Kids ask me, young actors and stuff, they say, will you be my mentor? And I'm saying, I don't fucking know you. <laughs> I don't know you. Right. <laughs> but you can't just call me up, meet me on the street and say like, listen, no, no. Mentorship is something that's cultivated. Yes. Apprenticeship is something that's worked on. You have to plant a seed. You have to water it. Nurture it. It's a relationship. That shit ain't no fly by Instagram shit. Hey, DM me. Can you mentor me? And what would, you know, what would you, no, motherfucker, I'm not giving you it. Those are precious lessons. Exactly. It's like if I'm Yoda or Obi-Wan and shit, motherfucker, you got to come to the Dagobah system, Jack. Like, yeah. you got to come and see me. You got to come sit. Yeah. I have to go sit. I got to go sit with the elders. We can't just do it over coffee one day. I'm going to hand you the book and say, here it is, and go forth. No, you're trying to cheat. It doesn't work that way because you want it now. You're saying in your 20s, I need to be living my best life. I need to be rich. I need to have all this dough. No, motherfucker. People don't become millionaires till after 45, 50. So do the work now. Yeah. I ran to a young girl when you used to be able to go places and shit without a man. 
I don't remember those days. Yeah. She was like 23, 24. She was telling me like what she wanted to do. And she was saying she wanted to start her own podcast, you know, okay. said, I want to bring people together and I want to like talk to people about what they want to do in their life. And I said, well, what, what are you going to do? <laughs> what have you done that constitutes your ability to bring motherfuckers together? Are you 23, 24 years old? You ain't even done shit. How the fuck are you going to sit around? I, I was telling her, I was like, go live and come back in 10 years and start the, the germination of what that could be. But you ain't done shit. That's what I'm saying. You guys want to cheat the system and skip the line. I'm not saying there ain't no bad mother jumpers out there, but I'm saying by and large, you kids don't know shit. Right. And people want that instant gratification. Yep. I think the work part is where many people can falter. Yeah. You know, even me doing this podcast, it's with 27 years of production experience Hello. under my belt. And I'm still building this thing. Right. I think what's also important is the willingness to be a student. Yeah. You had said something earlier that I wanted to go back to because I've had multiple conversations, both privately and also on the podcast, about that shirt that you were wearing and how your teacher was encouraging you to be the person to help bring people in to understand. Yes. And I know you do that. Mm -hmm. But do you ever get exhausted to be the ambassador to have to constantly represent and educate people who may be limited in their perspective. I've had multiple conversations, both on this podcast and also privately with different people. Um, but for this conversation, let's just, you know, focus on people in the public eye who are, you know, maybe they're exhausted of being the ambassador, the one to constantly inform others and to be, quote unquote, the example. What's your position on that? Because I feel like I'm kind of caught. In some ways, I feel like if I'm not representing people or representing Asians mm -hmm. to people that have very limited exposure, like how do we make it better if I don't mm. inform and represent? I love this great question. I disagree that I can't be the ambassador or whatever like that. For me, that's being lazy. Everyone's different. Everyone's different. That's me. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. you know, because I understand, but like, I'm 47 years old, and yes, I get tired, but it's my charge. Mm. This is the responsibility of being an actor. This is the responsibility of that comes with the talent, that comes with the opportunity. And how I do it is different. Now, I'm not going to make a speech, I'm not going to write a book. I'm not going to go on Meet the Press and, you know, talk about whatever with Chuck Todd. Right. But what I'm going to do is when I work on set, when I go to a restaurant, when I see people out in public, I'm going to educate. And how I do it, I do it with humor. Mm. I do it with some non sequiturs. I do it with little zingers that I give to people. You know what I mean? Yes, you do. Little, little stop. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that's how I make people think. And right. so, see, the thing is, this is what I believe. We have to understand. We have to put ourselves in a person's shoes. And quite honestly, a lot of people don't give a fuck. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like, they, yeah. well, let's, let's be honest now. Yeah, yeah. We're saying this from a, a perch of being educated, of a perch of being exposed, of a perch of being artists. We're all like, our minds are open and we can talk about ex Black exceptionalism and Asian, you know what I mean? We can do all right. that shit because we're open, right? But the average person don't give a shit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's who we're trying to reach, the everyday people. Right. That's what the work is for. The work ain't for us. We're part of the choir. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> when we're talking about what it is to be Black in America and what we have to deal with, no, that's constant. Let's think about this for a second. Here we are, slavery, 16 fucking 19. You got slavery stopped in 1865. You got fucking Jim Crow. Yeah. Right? Indentured servitude, sharecropping. Right. You know what I'm saying? Separate but fucking unequal. Right. You know what I'm saying? All this bullshit, right? That happens. This is 400 fucking years. Now, let's think about this. We've been dealing with shit for over 400 motherfucking years. And you said, said woman, said Asian, said Middle Easterner, is going to come in here. For 20, and be complaining for 20 fucking years and you expected to change over a fucking night? 
How dare you? I mean, think about that for a second. How fucking dare you gonna wake up and grow up all the work we're still trying to do? Just as black people, not even black women, just black people. And you come up for 40 years and say, we deserve this. And you, and, and you wonder why you're mad. You don't understand why people don't give a shit. Because we're still trying to change the minds of the average mother jumper. And you're saying it's not my job to do the work. It's not my job to be an ambassador. It's not my job to go out there and teach. It is. It's not going to change if we don't. Right. So, so everybody is constant, whether it be for Asian rights, whether it be for women's rights, for lesbian and homosexual gay rights, whatever it is, it's, it, it, it's constant. The fight doesn't end. So having said that, how do people like you and I not get so frustrated and defeated um, and, and it becomes toxic? If you and I are con- and people like us are constantly in the front and there's many people that are doing the work, you know, day to day life in every in small things and in big things, in conversations, when we go to the workplace, how we talk to other people, these are all you may see think are small, but I think they are impactful. But as you said it, it is constant. It's been 400 years. So we're not going to change it in five years, in 20 years. It is a constant tug of war. But having said that, how do people like you and I stay afloat and not take on that toxicity so we become enraged and insane? I, I think that in that, I mean, I think it's a very simple, it's, it's one word, it's balance. I mean, I think you have to have balance. Not every fight is for you. Like, we're a cross-section of people, and so you have to forgive yourself. I have to forgive my, like I told you, I know what my capabilities are, and I know what my threshold is. Like I said to you, I'm not going to write a book because I understand what my capacity is. Mm. So I'm going to give it to you through the work. That's going to have a level of consciousness and conscientiousness and presence. Then when, when I do said interview, I'm going to come with some semblance of, of real truth and authenticity so that it's still going to make people think and feel. Right. And also, it's not always about browbeating people over the head to get a clue. No, it's rarely that way. Right. A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine to go down, right? Yeah, for sure. So sometimes you get, we do it through comedy. We do it through music. We do it through this. You know what I'm saying? Like that becomes my charge. So I have to know my limitations and I have to understand what those are. And it's taken me up to about 40 something years old to be comfortable with what my way is going to be. I, I used to feel guilty back in the day because I would have these thoughts and these tongues and these feelings. And people said, well, shit, man, you got all this shit to say. Why don't you go? You should write a fucking book. You should break a speech. And I was like, no, but that's not me. But as my visibility has grown and broadened, and I'm able to come on platforms such as yours and others. I know what my thoughts and tongues are and I can express that, but also I have balance. So I have, I have, I have a wife, I have kids. I, I can relax. I can, I can turn it off and say, Hey man, I'm not doing it today. I don't read every article that comes out about black boys being killed and this. I sometimes just can't deal with it. There are days you don't want to engage right. in that. So what do I want to do? I'm going to put on some music. I'm going to put on the sense of this movie. I'm going to la, 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 la. Give myself a respite. What do they say? You get two days to prepare for five. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah I hate that. <laughs> that's for me, that's it's balance. It's about living your life. It's about understanding you're not gonna change the world in a day. I mean, I talk to Uber drivers. We put over to the side of the road and we I'm talking to a guy who's like says somewhat racist, prejudiced thing in his Uber. I'm just engaging him, just talking to him. And, and we'll sit for like another 20 minutes and just have a conversation. And it would be like, hey, man, thank you. I moved somebody that for that moment. And I look for that. But see, that's me, though. I don't mind being the ambassador. I don't mind bringing people in through my ingratiating people through a smile and a song that I may sing. And they go, wow, that's good. That's interesting. You know what I'm saying? Well, you know, the history of that song came from 1946. And it was originally did by a black man and then the white folks. <laughs> but everyone has different ways and different tools. Absolutely. And we have to embrace that. Yes. Yes. Do the work. Right. The larger point is you can't say it's not my job or it's not my place. Like if you're on the battlefield, mm. it's your place. 
to do it in some way, but we're on the battlefield, right? We're in arts, we're in entertainment, we're in politics. You're in high visibility. High visibility. And so it's important to, you know, to know your history. It's important to, to be up on certain aspects of current events. Right. What's happening in the world and have an opinion about what's going on. And then at times not be afraid to engage and then not be afraid to be wrong. Exactly. But that's called learning. <laughs> right. And that's what but see, that comes from sitting on the knee, listening to people, you know what yes. I mean? Then, you know, oh man, ooh, I was wrong about this. And then you come turn back around, you go, oh, okay. Right. Engage in conversation and do the work. And also when you engage in conversation, you have to be open, like truly open to receive. Yes. And if you don't agree, graciously and, and diplomatically try to debate. Yeah, about two weeks ago, I was at a restaurant here in New Orleans and a white gay man sat next to me. And uh, he was the same age, 47 years old. And he's a hairstylist and he used to be a dancer. And he was, you know, just talking about what his struggle has been as a gay man and, you know, things of that nature. And we had a very transparent conversation, though, about what homosexuality means for him as a white gay man versus what it means for black gay men. And what black gay men go through and then what white gay men don't go through. We closed the place down. We were having some wine and, and really engaging. You know, he told me some of his, his truths and I told him what my understandings were based on him as a white man, but also based on what I've seen black gay men live through. Mm -hmm. To make a long story short, the beautiful thing was this man, he honestly said to me, you caused me to think a different way. And so I come in there about four days later, my wife, the gentleman comes in comes back to me and he says to me, I want to thank you for our conversation. He's like, I haven't had a, an open conversation like that in years. He said, you opened my mind. He said, just thank you. And he said to my wife, he said, your husband was beautiful. I just appreciated our this conversation. He and I wasn't afraid of anything. He wasn't afraid to hear it and he would say it. And we put it all on the table. We were, you know, we were generous, but diplomatic and respectful, everything like that. And the beautiful thing, what he said was, I thought that I had a different level of empathy being an artist and being an hairstylist. Mm, interesting. He said, I realized I didn't. And he owned it. Like, he was like, wow, I realized I had been conditioned. That's amazing that he did that. Yeah. And we were just able to have a beautiful, and this man was great. Like, he was just, you know, it was beautiful. And I haven't seen him since, but that's what I'm saying. Not being afraid, being an ambassador, not being afraid to engage with people. And he was saying things that I didn't agree with, never got an attitude, never got mad. And we, we talked through it and it made me feel great. I think a lot of people have forgotten how to have those types of conversations. Mm -hmm. And that's adding to the already complicated and like out of control world we're living in right now. Yeah. And I understand that life is hard and we're doing everything that we possibly can just to keep up. But I do think it's a good idea to, you know, slow down a little bit and take an honest look at ourselves mm -hmm. and do the work and say like, hey, maybe I'm wrong or maybe I haven't thought about this or, you know, and I'm not saying that that's always the case, but I do think it's important for us to kind of look at ourselves first and then also be open to hearing someone else, like truly hearing somebody else mm -hmm. and having the humility to know you don't know anything. <laughs> you don't know anything. That's the whole thing of why I, I'm really disheartened by aspects of this sort of cancel culture thing. Because we're not open to the dialogue. You know what I mean? No, it's just... It's just like, well, you said something foul. Like, you're gone. Like, I don't appreciate that. That's toxic. That's this. That's that. And it's like, hey, hey, hey. Like, you're, again, you're, you're asking somebody to change their behavior overnight. Yeah, it's not going to happen. But they've been living for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and you're saying th those terms don't work anymore. You're gone. No, 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 no. Let's educate the people. Let's enlighten them. I mean, even when people say racist shit, you can't simply go, hey, man, fire him, fire her. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, you got to go, hey, man, come on, bro. You know we down there no more. We ain't on, on candy land. And they go, oh, my gosh. Oh, shit. Shit, I'm so sorry. And give the people an opportunity to really apologize. And change. And change. Or to learn or to understand. I don't think there's a problem with checking somebody and just say, 
hey, that, that terminology ain't cool in my presence. I'd appreciate it if you didn't say it. So, Russell, what's one piece of advice that you have gotten that helps you remain grounded and remember to be uh, grateful? In 2004, I was doing a play uh, in New York called Intimate Apparel by Lynn Nottage. And then we were at, we were doing like a, like a soiree at the famed Sardi's restaurant you know, mm-hmm. in Midtown. So there was a, an older actor who's no longer, he's an ancestor now, no longer with us. His name is Roscoe Lee Brown. Okay. He comes up to me and he says, young man, I have to tell you, you are talented, seemingly bright and handsome. He said, but remember this. Never mistake your presence for the event. Ooh. I, hadn't, I, had, I had not yet turned 30. I was 29. And it took me about a year to fully absorb that and understand what that really meant. Break it down for the listeners. It's simple. It ain't about you. Exactly. None of this shit is about you. Right. So don't take yourself all too serious. This shit ain't me. And it ain't about you. You know what I mean? I, hey, I, I give everybody a little grace. I'm going to come in ready. I'm going to come in cordial. People are going through stuff, but it ain't about you. I asked myself, Russell, are you, are you greenlighting this project? Are we here because of you? Did you get the funding for it? Like, no. Somebody gave you a job. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Even for the people that you know, do get the funding for it or do green light it. It is still not about them because it is a collaborative effort that makes it all happen. Interestingly enough, I find generally most of those people that do come with a lot more grace because they realize what it took to get there. You see like the man who owns the company, they're coming on nice. You find out like a couple of days later, a week later that, oh, that's the owner or that was the producer or that was. So, oh, she was so I, I'm so I didn't realize they were so cool. Right. Yeah. Do you feel like it's one of those situations? And it's a throwback to what you were saying about the, uh, the the person who was 20 and wanted to do a podcast to bring people together or just young people today or many people today, actually, because I don't think it's just an age thing. No, right. When you skip primary steps. You don't realize the work on a granular level of what it took to build. And therefore, you don't have the sense and then also the respect that it took to get to that. So when you don't understand the process, you can't possibly understand or have the depth when you take shortcuts. You just can't. That's, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And that's what happens when, you know, when you do skip skips, that's when people just lack of generally, generally, of course. Yes, generally, of course. Uh, appreciation. And I've been saying that because I'm seeing it, you know, on the show I'm doing now, there's, you know, some young PAs and, you know, this, and they're coming up. They want us to get the information. This one young lady said, uh, she says, well, I want to act. I said, oh, great. Okay, good. So you want to go, but I want to write. That's great. That's fantastic. But, and I want to produce as well. I said, whoa, okay. So you want to be a hyphen? Right. She says, yeah. I said, well, let's, why don't you try to do one first? Yeah. Master something first. Building blocks. Then move on. Yes. She said, well, are you saying I can't do it? No, no, no. Didn't say that. You can do it all. I would say my suggestion would be to master one thing first, then move on. Yes. I said, because all you're doing is juggling balls and you're just keeping them in the air. And you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. And it took her a minute. Like, And we were with a couple other young people, about five of us. It took her a minute to kind of grasp that. No, no, I'm not saying you can't do X, Y, and Z. Ain't nobody telling you that. You can <laughs> right. do it. You can do it all. But like you said, building blocks. Just take some steps. There's levels. And I'm glad she understood what I was coming from. And she took the time. To, they all took the time to like kind of listen. The one thing that I've learned is patience. I'm no longer losing my patience that the way I used to. But now I, I breathe. Mm. And I go, let me come back another way. Listen, I want to keep you forever because you know I love spending time with you and and talking with you. Thank you so much. This is a joy. I appreciate it. And I appreciate everything that you do and always the professionalism and kindness that you have always brought to every set that you and I have ever worked on together. We have a signature sign-off on every podcast. 
Um, let me know who you are and what you represent. I consider myself a feeling person. So as an artist, you go through life, but you have to observe people. You have to listen. And people are hurting. You can't always give them money. You can't always do something for them. But in my small way, I like to think that what I do, the way I approach the work, it represents them. And it brings them some sense of joy or clarity or understanding or feeling where they can say, he got it, or I feel that. There's one thing when somebody says, I hear you, I understand, but it's another thing when somebody says, I feel you. I like to think that I represent the people because the people don't always have an opportunity to speak. And like I said, just in the work I do, I try to bring that, I try to bring them with me in the work, in the characters that I create and portray. The postal worker stops me and says, hey, brother, man, I appreciate what you're doing, your roles, like, man. I go, that's the reward. I'm Russell Hornsby and I represent the people. With gratitude and respect to Russell Hornsby for making time to guest, for sharing his passion, powerful insight, experiences, and words. People, get to your computers and follow this man and go watch his films. I'll have all of his social media links in the show description for you. And if you like this episode, be sure to check out past conversations with some amazing guests because they're all available for download. And please subscribe, share, and leave a review. You can do that on Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, Podchaser, or wherever you're listening to podcasts. I love hearing from you, and it really does mean a lot. Next up, she's an author, an expert on serial killers. Yeah, I said that. World-class forensic psychologist, Dr. Katherine Ramslin is here. I do trainings for police officers and attorneys and anyone interested in extreme offenders. I've recently been working on a four-part documentary on the book that I wrote with the BTK serial killer, Dennis Rader. We worked for five years on his criminal autobiography. Hello, I'm Dr. Katherine Ramsland. Don't miss my episode of Reppin coming up next. I'm always reachable via social media. So catch me on Twitter at Reppin Podcast or Instagram at Reppin underscore podcast. Always love and thanks to my team. Reppin is a Suburban Outlaw Productions. Until next time, stand up and represent. Represent.